We invite you to turn in your Bibles tonight to the book of Acts, chapter number 12. The book of Acts, chapter number 12. Our lesson title tonight is Herod and Peter. Acts chapter 12, beginning with verse number 1. The word Herod is the same word like the word Pharaoh or the word Caesar. It's really not a name, it's a title actually. This title is supposed to mean hero, but I don't think he's very heroic myself. I think he's kind of a dirty dog, but uh, anyhow, uh, this is Herod Agrippa I, and uh, he's strictly a politician. In Acts chapter 12, verse number 1, now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. He's not going to vex or oppose or trouble or oppress anybody other than the church. Yeah. That's going to be different from the Jews. And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. But don't worry, God's got another one in verse 17. Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. So God had a spare. Don't worry about it. God's got him, got him covered. And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews. Now that phrase right there really opens up what's going on here. He proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him unto four sets of four soldiers, four quarternons of soldiers to keep him Intending after, and I do not know why the King James gentlemen, as smart as they are, translated this word Easter when they have translated it 28 other times as Passover. It is the exact same Greek word that 28 times in your Bible is translated Passover, but this one time they translated Easter. Intending after Passover to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, God beat him to it. The same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined into the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. So we know Peter didn't sleep with his shoes on. So he did, and he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not, knew not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but he thought he saw a vision. And when they were past the first and second guard, or ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city. I guess it went out from the prison uh, uh, walls in, on into the city, which opened them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. God get you out, you got to get yourself on. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, now this is one of those great uh, understandings and perceptions that Peter has in the book of Acts that show you a very monumental time in the Christian church age. And he says, now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. If you look back at chapter 10 and verse number 34, Peter has his first perception as he enters into Cornelius' house. Then Peter opened his mouth in 1034. Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. These two perceptions are, are monumental in separating the Christian church away from the Jewish hierarchy. 
this, this is causing there to be a spiritual church, neither Jew nor Gentile, but believers. And so the Lord d does away with the dietary laws, and Peter perceives now that God will accept any man of any nation that fears the Lord and works righteousness. And that's exactly the description of Cornelius in the first part of that chapter. Now in chapter 12 and verse 11, Peter finds out that God also is going to deal with the government and with the harlot church. He is going to tear down the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentiles, as we know in Ephesians chapter 2, and have one body. Jesus said in John 16, was it mm, verse 11? I can't remember. Uh, that uh, he would have another flock. Other sheep have I. He said that I must bring in. And uh, let's see if I can find it. Nope, I can't. I'm not going to waste time on it. But anyhow, somewhere in the Bible it says something like this. Jesus said, other sheep have I. That must be brought in, but there will be one fold and one shepherd. So this is what the Lord was doing, tearing down the middle wall of partition. And Peter saw that in Cornelius' house. And now he's seeing that no authority on earth is greater than Christ's authority. Look at John 19, 11. John 19 in verse number 11. I like that verse where it says Jesus sent out his disciples two by two whither he himself would come. And I'm glad that we don't have to go anywhere that Jesus does not precede, that he does not come and, and, and blaze the way for us. So the Lord Jesus had already stood in this place where Peter was. Then Pilate, uh, John 19, 10, then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and I have power to release thee, Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. The power that the harlot church had was sinful power. And it was, uh, it was noted by Christ that of the two, between the beast, government, Pilate, Herod, and, and, and the great whore, the Jewish church, the apostate church, uh, the greatest sin was of the Jews. But this all here we see these two coming together again and coming up against Peter in the day now, not of the time when Jesus Christ stood on earth in a physical body, but a time when now the Holy Ghost has come, which makes it a far more uh, important circumstance and a greater sin that these two entities the beast and the whore are trying to accomplish this is this is uh, the the church uh, trying to reestablish the Jewish uh, community trying to reestablish what was authorized by God in times past but now God has done away with it in times past as you will see listed on your prayer list in Deuteronomy chapters 13 and 17 the Jewish church in the old economy it was a theocracy theos means God theology is the study of God so theocracy is a Godocracy what does that mean you have you have a democracy or a democracy uh, government by the people but this was a theocracy it was government of God so you notice in the old economy that the high priest was involved with the war. The kings were involved with the war. Uh, the, 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 the priests were called on to tell the kings when to go to war and when not to go to war. And the, the kings were the, the civil power that carried out the commands of God given to the priests. But that was over and done with. And it was sad, dear soul that they're trying to reestablish this, and the devil keeps trying to reestablish it down through the ages. Let's do, to, do go to one scripture in Deuteronomy 17, 15. Just one, one verse. You can read those others later. The other ones in your prayer list, Deuteronomy 13, uh, 12 through 18, and Deuteronomy 17, 2 through 7, 
tell you that the Jewish church had the authority to kill one individual or a whole city of individuals, wipe out an entire city if they found them to be idolatrous. It was under their authority to be able to do so. In fact, if they didn't do it, God would have wiped them out. Deuteronomy 17 and verse 15. Thou shalt in any wise, verse 14, when thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee and shall possess it and shall dwell therein and shall say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee that thou mayest not Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. King Herod was not a Jew. He was a slick politician who was in with Caligula, the emperor of Rome, that gave him this position. And he always knew how to work the Jews and how to deal with the Jews to keep a feather in his own hat and make his rule over Palestine and this area to be a lot easier. So he's always going and siding with the Jews as much as he possibly can, but staying in favor with Rome primarily. So we see that they are here under the authority again, trying to reestablish the beast, the government, is trying to reestablish its relationship with the whore, the, the apostate Jewish church. And it is uh, directly against the law of God in Deuteronomy 17, 15. And let me show you something else. When did this happen? John chapter 19, <clears throat> verse 13. When Peter, when Pilate, I'm sorry, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus for, well, here we go again. Verse 12, we read verse 11. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. I want you to get ready because I'm going to let you read the last sentence of the next verse. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? Go. The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Who was it that answered that? That's the highest authority you can get in Israel. These men spoke for the entire nation. This was a signing of a covenant. This was legal. This was a verbal contract dismissing God and taking on Rome. And here we have the same song, second verse. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. This is that same old romance between the whore and the beast. And what had happened was the Jews had had a king. You say, I know, King David, King Solomon, King Jehoshaphat or whatever. No, that's not what I'm talking about. This one was the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. His name was Jesus. And you know what they did with him? They murdered their king. And now they're going to substitute Herod in his place so that they can give Herod the biblical authority from Deuteronomy 13 and 17 
to execute their enemies for them. And dear soul, that is a bad deal for both of them. Because any time, and we're going to find this at the end of the chapter, you, you have a civil, excuse me, yeah, okay, let me go over that. Anytime you have a civil magistrate that is being given authority by the religious boys, he, they, he will turn into God every time. He will think himself to be God and that he can do no wrong and that everything he does is absolutely right and it's the will of God. And that's what happened. So here is a theocracy from hell. It wasn't really a theocracy because God was not involved in it. But it says in verse number one, vex certain of the church. Verse number three, he saw it please the Jews. Verse number 11, delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. So we see that Peter understood. He perfectly understood. He knew what God was doing. He knew that here was the devil trying to reestablish that which God had had in the old economy, and he's trying to bring it back now. Most of the, uh, I don't know what to call them, demigods, uh, uh, tyrants that we've had in the world thought themselves to be directly under the voice of God. And this is no exception. Would you look with me to Revelation 17? Revelation 17, verse number 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials. He was pouring out plagues on the earth. And he talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. <clears throat> I will show thee the judgment, not the great whore, but I will show you the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. She sits as queen. You have the word sitteth in verse number one. You have the word sit in verse number three. And in verse number nine, on which the woman sitteth. She is enthroned in her own mind. She is enthroned by the powers of the devil and the powers of darkness, and she finds her authority with, uh, with, with the uh, beast, with the government. And I will show you the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, whom the kings of the earth... Therefore, they are earthy, have committed fornication. What kind of fornication are we talking about? The James 4, 4 fornication. Friendship with the world. That's the adultery that he's talking about. And the inhabitants, here again, of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. That which enthuses you, enables you, gives you understanding beyond yourself is a spirit of the new wine, the Holy Ghost. These people have the spirit of the demonic wine, that of ambition and greed and covetousness, that desire like Nimrod to rule over men. And to be in authority over all other men. The desire for power. I have power to deal with you as I please. Pilate said to Christ. He said, I'm going to show you that. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman, the great whore, sit upon a scarlet colored beast, human government, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. 
And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered or marveled with great admiration. Dear soul, here is the devil at the very outset, at the very beginning of Christian history, the moment that it gets into Antioch and the word comes back to Jerusalem. And the religious guys called Peter in, in in Acts chapter 11 and said, Peter, we heard some things about you. We want to give you a chance to answer for yourself. Is it true that you entered into a Gentile's house? Is it true that you did eat those things that are not lawful for a Jew to eat in a Gentile's house? And is it true that you preached the gospel to him? He said, yes, I'm guilty on every count. They bowed their heads to God in that. And those Jews in chapter 11 proved to be part of the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you can't keep something like that away from those who do not like that. Peter has been giving away privileges that are exclusively given to us by God unto the dogs, the Gentiles. And we don't like it. Can you imagine what goes on in the back rooms? Can you imagine what goes on in the political chambers? Can you imagine how the high priest uh, t said, tell Herod I want to meet with him out behind the barn. I got something I want to talk to him. Whatever happened, the wheels start turning and those Jews that didn't like it, they get Herod's attention and he's always willing to please the Jews. So those phrases that we read, you vexing the church, pleasing the Jews, and how uh, that God delivered me from Herod and the expectation of the people of the Jews. All of those phrases show you that Herod was acting out this thing in order to enhance himself with the Jews, with those who were in authority, with those who were rich, with those who were powerful, and could make his life a lot easier. That's what you have here. The thing that makes me giggle every time I read it is in verse number 5 of, of Acts chapter 12. Peter therefore was kept in prison. And the giggling thing is, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. You don't know what you got, buddy. You got a tiger by the tail and you don't know it. Now, how did this turn out? How did this turn out? In Revelation 17, it didn't turn out good for either one of them. In Revelation 17 and verse number 10, and there were seven kings, five are fallen. That's Egypt, Assyria, Persia, Babylon, and Greece. All right? Uh, and one is, what was the is beast or king in that day Rome mm -hmm. that's six and the other one is not yet come and when he cometh he must continue listen a short space there'll be a little season when human government will once again seek to attain rule under the dominion of Satan and those ten kings won't be one except in spirit. It won't be like under Caesar or under Nebuchadnezzar or, or under, 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 what was his name? The great um, Alexander. Thank you. Alexander. It won't be one nation. It will be ten different nations with the same idea. We got to get rid of religion. So you got one is, that was wrong, and now you got another to come. And he won't last but for a short space, which is the little season, season of Revelation 20 and verse 3. Excuse me. 
And then in verse number 11. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. This, you say, that's confusing. The seventh one, is, it's just what I just got through telling you. It's not going to be like the other six. The seventh one is going to be so different, he'll be like an eighth. He'll be different from the rest. It'll be ten kings bound together with determination to destroy religion off the earth. Listen. And the beast that was and is not, that is, he was for the six different kings that have already been, five that was and one is. Uh, he said, and the ten kings which thou sawest, excuse me, and the ten horns, I'm leaving out stuff, verse 11, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, he's going to be so different from the rest, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. What happened to Herod? He went to hell with his britches on, he went to hell with his robes on. Verse 12, and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive, and may I add, individual power as kings for how long? One hour. One hour. How long is that? That's a little space, a short space, verse 10. It's a little season, Revelation 20 and verse 3. All right? The reason that these are these make up a kingdom is that they have one mind and shall give their authority, their power, and strength unto the beast. Now, what is the desire of these ten horns? Verse 14, the same desire that we're reading tonight of Herod. These shall make war with the Lamb. That's all they want to do. Herod wanted to vex the church. Herod wanted to please the Jews. The one thing Peter saw that God did was stop Peter, excuse me, stop Herod from accomplishing the expectation of the Jews. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. That's why I giggled back there in 12.5, because God had his people praying. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful alright and he saith unto me the waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues now where was the church told to go and preach Back in chapter 5, I think it's verse 9. Thou, and they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Uh, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, and here we go, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So these in 5.9 are of the population of the world that have heard the gospel and have believed. But these in Revelation 17 and verse number 15 are those that have heard the gospel and rejected Christ. They're out of the same bunch because there are many that are called but few that are chosen. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, watch it now, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Why are they going to do that? There ain't nothing worse than an old used up diseased whore. And that's what the harlot church is. God's people are called a chaste virgin. She's called a pure bride this is just the opposite what is a whore it's a woman that has thrown off her headship walked away from her father or her husband and said I'll do what I want to and I'll use my body to get anything I want that's what this is 
How come this happened? Verse 17. For God hath put in their hearts. Ooh, whose hearts? The hearts of the ten kings. To fulfill his will. And why are they of one mind? In verse 13. Because God hath put in their hearts to agree. In verse 17. And to give their kingdom unto the beast. For how long? Until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the, the kings of the earth. It is harlot, Jerusalem. So we see that this is nothing new. Herod doing this is that which is prophesied. Is that which God does. It's God that puts it in their hearts to fulfill his will. This is going to be the dealings with those who reject his son and refuse him. The devil is going to have to play, play the street sweeper and the garbage collector. He's going to have to clean up all this mess. And the devil thinking that he is now putting together a theocracy like God had in the olden times will put this back together not knowing that he's fulfilling the will of God and bring to pass that which God had ordained from the very beginning. Ain't you glad? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> First Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians 2.14 For ye, brethren... Became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. All right, we're speaking of the Jews. First Thessalonians 2.15. Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. They ain't worth nothing but to be thrown in the garbage. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, listen, to fill up their sins alway, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. It's not going to be good for the apostate Jewish church in Jerusalem, and they're not going to get what they promised themselves when the high priest meets in the back room with Herod and they make a deal to do something about the church because Peter and James and them guys are giving away our exclusive privileges from God. We ain't going to have these Gentiles having this. And we can't believe that in chapter 11 of Acts it's recorded that the Jewish church who had been born again and come to know God they gave glory to God and received it. So these guys were forced to do something. We've got to do something immediately. And they did. How did it turn out for them? Anybody know what happened in 70 A.D. in Jerusalem? Jesus said there wouldn't be one stone left on another. Guess what? I believe it. They said those Jews swallowed their money and their jewels and Everything they could ran out of Jerusalem trying to get away and the Romans found out about it and as they would run out they would slit their bellies open while they were alive and steal their money out of their bellies. That's what they got for turning on God. How did it turn out for the beast? Well, Revelation 11. Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> Neither one of them are going to get what they want. Revelation eleven fifteen, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he, not Pilate, not Herod, not anybody else, shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their thrones, 
sat, uh, fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast, and hast reigned. And the nations were angry. The nations were angry. And thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged. And that's not talking about physically dead. It's talking about the spiritually dead. And that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. And shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testimony. There was lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. What do we know those things to be? You don't have to rack your brain. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 26. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet what's more, I shake not the earth only in giving the law at Sinai, but I will shake heaven. That is the spiritual realm. Uh, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken. He said there would be earthquakes in that passage we just read. There would be the removing of those things that, that can be shaken. The house on the sand fell. And of those things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken, the house upon the rock was uh, sustained and they, that they may remain. Now, what are we talking about in all this? Simplify it, brother. Okay. Verse 28. All of this, we're talking about earthquakes and shakings and all this. It's nothing more. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let the floods come. Let the rains fall. Let the winds blow. Let the pilots come. Let the Herods come. Let the agnostics, the atheists, let all of them come. Let the harlot church deny God. Let there be as much of abomination before God as there possibly can be. You will not shake God's church. Because she's founded on Jesus Christ, the solid rock. All this shaking going on, it's just nothing more than God receiving his kingdom which cannot be moved. What are you going to do during all that shaking? Let us have grace. You like that? Yeah. Let us have grace whereby we may serve the Lord acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. And you're going to have to be made fire to be able to endure the fire if you're standing in the presence of God and His glory. It didn't turn out good for either one of them. The Jews had the Romans to destroy them and tear down everything they had in 70 AD. The key to this, dear soul, and I want to show it to you, is the glory of God. Acts chapter 11. Let's go back over there and see what happened when Peter told them all about the gospel being preached. We'll just read a few verses in Acts chapter 11, verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them. Who? Those Gentiles of Cornelius' house. As on us at the beginning. Same Holy Ghost fell on them like it did us. Then remembered I the word of the Lord. How that he said, John indeed baptized with water. This is the scripture the Holy Ghost brought in Peter's mind when he saw the Holy Spirit falling in Cornelius' house. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. What was I that I should withstand God? The response. When they heard these things, they did two things. Number one, they held their peace. Would you tell me what number two is? Glorified God. Glorified God. Now, if you hear 
of the blessing and benefit of the church, even though it's not according to what you and I may think it ought to be, even if it's according to that which Orthodox Jews, maybe even Orthodox Jews who are born again, don't like, and you know it to be God, you zip your lip and say, let God be God. Somebody say amen. Help me out here. Yes. All right? Say amen or owe me one. All right. When they heard these things, they held their peace, and they glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Isn't that good? Yeah. Now, that's the true church among the Jews. The issue in all of this is the glory of God. All right. In Acts chapter 12, <clears throat> Herod is still mad. He has the uh, guards killed. And I like verse 18. It's just so unbelievably good. This will make you giggle too. Acts 12, 18. Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers. And I like these last words. What was become of Peter? How did he get out? I, I woke up with chains on me, but the chain wasn't on him. And the other, the other book in on the other side, yep, I had the chain on me, but it wasn't on him. And the guard at the door said, I did not move all night. And I didn't go to sleep on my job. And they went through the second ward, the second guard post. And he said, you know what? That big old gate out there, it always squeaks. We don't have any oil to put on that big old thing. And it always makes a racket. I didn't hear anything. What has become of Peter? By the way, th this, is, this is next to the last time you hear of Peter in the whole book of Acts. He shows up again in Acts 15, and that's it. So Herod was mad. He sought for him, in verse 19, and examined the keepers. And he's so mad and so embarrassed, he puts them to death. And both him and Peter were displaced. In Acts 7, 12, 17, it says in the last sentence, And he, Peter, departed and went into another place. It not only sent Peter away, and we don't see him on the pages of the book of Acts until Acts 15 at the council in Jerusalem, and then after that you don't see him anymore. But it also displaced Herod. The last sentence in verse 19, and he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. He was so embarrassed he had to get out of the country. But he's still mad. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but they found somebody to kind of appease him a little bit. And then he decided, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll set myself up and show how glorious I am. Uh, them Jews already said, you know, that I'm like God and I have the authority to do whatever they want me to do. I can kill people and it's all right with God. And because they showed me in their Bible in Deuteronomy 13 and 17 that they have the authority to, uh, to kill anybody that, that is an idolater. And these people are worshiping that Jesus that we put to death. So these people are idolaters, so I have every right to kill them. And didn't Jesus say something about there'll come a time when yeah. Yeah. people will kill you and think they're doing God's work, doing God a service? Yeah. Your only safety tonight is obedience to Christ. All right. Verse 21, And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and you know how politicians are, made an oration unto them. Remember, I know I've said a lot since then, but keep it in mind, the whole issue with this thing is the glory of God. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. 
And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because why? You read it to me. Because. What did they do in 1118 that let you see that these were true Christian Jews? Zip their lip and gave God the glory. Amen. What happened to Herod? And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him. Why? Because he gave not God the glory and it was eaten of worms and gave up his spirit or the ghost. Isn't that something? Mm -mm -mm. Look back to Luke chapter 9. Please. Luke chapter 9, verse 28. Herod, in sitting there in his royal robes and making his voice known, had his followers, his disciples, whatever you want to call them, say, wow, we've seen God. That's the counterfeit of what we're fixing to read you. That's the real thing. Herod, in his royal robes, with people saying, ooh, that's God, is the counterfeit. Here is the real thing. Luke 9, 28. And it came to pass about in eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in what? It ain't talking about in heaven. It's talking about in a, in a state of, of splendor and glory. Who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw what? His glory and the two men that stood with him. Now, what glory is that? Turn on over to John 1. What glory is that? They saw his glory. They knew what that glory was. John chapter 1 and verse number 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. We saw his glory. Luke chapter 9. And we beheld his glory. What glory was it? The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh, my soul. You have the Jewish church giving God glory. They, therefore, are blended in with Christ and the Gentiles to make up one body. You have the counterfeit, the devil coming up with his God-man. He puts him on a throne. He gives him a bride, a religious bride, but she's a whore. And he reestablishes and sets up exactly what God has set up. You see, everything the devil has is a counterfeit. Yes. But you can't counterfeit something unless there is an original somewhere. So if you, if you can, the book says, The righteous man wisely considereth the house of the wicked. You can look at what the devil does and even in that come to understand something about God if you understand he's the devil. So here in Acts chapter 12, we have Herod the beast clothed in his raiments with the whore worshiping and calling him God. And the one thing that's missing there is that which Satan never has understood about us human beings and that is sin was coming short of the glory of God 
And Satan at the end commits what we did at the beginning and fails to give God glory. And he winds up in hell with that whore. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus Christ is above all power and principalities and power and might, angels and principalities being subject unto him, for he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Children, it don't make any difference how bad it gets out there. Your issue is never get your eyes turned away from ascribing the glory to God. That's your safety. That's your safety. Mm. Herod imitates the church's head. And he is destroyed because of it. Next time we see Peter, Acts chapter 15... Next, next time we see Peter in Acts chapter 15, Herod imitated the church's head. Peter is going to instruct the church's heart. And this is the last time he's mentioned in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 15, <laughs> verse 6, And the apostles and the elders came together for to consider of this matter, because some of them said, you got to be bapt uh, got, excuse me. Got to be circumcised to be saved. And when there had been much disputing, here's the first time his name's mentioned since that ordeal over there, where he went to another place. Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. That was at Cornelius's house. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did us. Now watch it now. And put no difference between us and them. How does God purify the believer's heart? By the keeping of the law? What did Peter say? And put no difference between us and them purifying their hearts last two words please by faith. by faith that's what Peter learned and all Rome and all the Caesars and all the Nebuchadnezzars and all the Alexander the Greats and all the powers of darkness straight out of hell can't do a thing about it God saved you on purpose and he's purifying your heart by faith. And these other fellas that want to say, well, we got to keep the law to be saved. You ain't circumcised. You ain't saved. You know, if you don't dress like we do, if you don't act like we do, if you don't. Listen, folk. I don't want to be like them. I want to be like Christ. And so here comes the end of Peter and Herod. Peter diminishes off the face of the book. Now, if you want to read about him, you got to go to over there. Paul may mention him here, there, and yonder. Or you got to go to his epistles, Peter's first and second epistles. And he'll tell you about the voice of glory, that voice that we heard in the midst of the great glory. And then Herod, he reigned approximately, the best I can figure out. Some of you scholars can get this straightened out. He reigned approximately from 37 A.D. to 44 A.D. They're pretty sure about his death. When he got spit of worms and died, it was 44 A.D. That's how long he lasted. But guess who still lived? The Lord Jesus Christ. Ain't that good? Folks, I'm going to tell you something. If I don't ever see you again, it won't matter. You'll be all right. You probably be a lot better, I, and I don't mean that funny. Listen, the only thing I'd ever want to leave with you is this: whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all 
to the glory of God. That is what made the difference in all this.